This is Unsilo brought to you by Alumni FM, connecting people through stories. Uh, welcome to Unsilo. This is Greg LeBlanc, and I'm here with Lance Esplund, who is a writer, teacher, author, regular contributor to the Wall Street Journal, art critic, and author of this book, The Art of Looking, How to Read Modern and Contemporary Art. Uh, welcome, Lance. Well, thank you for having me, Greg. So, look, this book is, is called, well, it's subtitled How to Read Modern and Contemporary Art, but I think the, the book is broader than that. It's, it's really uh, about how to, uh, <laughs> you know, read uh, art full stop uh, because you, you describe uh, what it means to be, I guess, a consumer of, of art. And I guess we'll have to talk about that, but we'll also talk, you know, what it is, uh, what makes contemporary art different and and what is it about the role of the critic does modern art contemporary art require right a greater contribution on the part of of critics do 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 people need more help when it comes to to reading modern and contemporary art than art from previous periods i don't think they really do in fact um interestingly enough I wanted to write this book for a while, but when it finally came to fruition, they wanted it to focus on modern and contemporary art, but I never teach that way and I never think of art that way. Artists don't think of art as existing on a timeline. Either it's alive and present or it isn't. Um, it's, it's either always dead or always alive. And I think that generally the people who believe that they need more hand-holding with contemporary art um, probably need just as much hand-holding with Rembrandt, uh, but they just don't know it. I think that, um, mm -hmm. granted, a lot has happened in the last 100, 200 years that has shifted um, what art can be, what art is understood to be, um, how you might interpret it. There's a lot of uh, uh, insider jokes. There's um, um, you know all kinds of uh, responses and toying with the public and toying with academies. And um, so, so you, there, there are things definitely that can be discussed about contemporary art that weren't ne necessary to discuss 500 years ago. But in the end, the basic language of art, which is what you were alluding to in terms of it's really about looking at all art full stop, that's what I'm trying to do is to open up people to that greater language that's universal and consistent throughout all art of, from any period or any culture. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, you talk uh, a bit about how some people have an, an immediate reaction, right, to art when they see it. Uh, and, um, you know, the art can trigger something and then, you know, maybe it starts to mirror something. Uh, but, but I think it, your, your point is that in order for you to really get the most out of art, you, you have to give it time. You have to let it open up. And, and presumably you have to bring something more to the table than just your immediate subjective response. So, so you know, you, you, you referenced the, the art of looking. How much does looking and understanding art require practice, require experience, and, and require kind of cumulative knowledge? I think it's a, a lifelong pursuit and relationship, just like any relationship. Um, uh, I think, you know, I'm still learning every day and I have my prejudices challenged constantly. So I'm, I'm not really unlike any other viewer who would come into a museum. I come in with my own objectivity and subjectivity and my own understanding. And I certainly have a deep understanding of the language of art. And I was a practicing painter and taught painting. So I, I have a real connection to it. But um, I think that the only way to learn the language is to engage on a passionate level and to have a kind of childlike curiosity with, you know, in front of actual works in the flesh. And, uh, you know, that's an that's really the only way to begin. And the only way to end is with the thing itself. Um, I don't know if that's getting to we're, we're going to unravel this. Basically, it's it's it's. <laughs> It's a very complex subject, and I think art is a, especially the fundamentals of art, um, which I really try to stress in teaching and also in my book, at least to introduce people to the fundamentals, um, is that they have to first accept that there is a language there, 
that there are things that they can understand about spatial shifts, for instance, in art, and how complicated and complex that is um, when light's achieved through color, um, when um, an artist has control of his or her media and can do with it um, and orchestrate it um, at the highest poetic level. And, and I think that uh, too often, especially since the camera was invented, people think of, the, of art as being mimetic instead of poetic. And this is the, you know, it never was that, and it never will be. Um, obviously, there are people who do that kind of thing, and they don't know any better, but, um, or that's their, their end game, is to make it just look like something or look like a photograph. But, but my, my, my objective with the book on some level was to empower people to start thinking like artists and to try to look at art and to mm -hmm. engage with it in a way that unlocks the poetry or where they can start to feel their way through it and see what an artist is trying to communicate um, at a very, my, you know, a very precise level. And it's, you know, it's one doorway opens another doorway opens another doorway to get at the metaphors in say a great uh, work of painting or sculpture or architecture or whatever it is. Um, but just, you know, the first step obviously is just to accepting that it is a language that needs to be learned and um, that it's not just about what you like or don't like. And, um, you know, and then let it go at that. And certainly you can go through life that way if you want. But, you know, it's really about understanding why and what, what are you getting from the work and what is the artist trying to communicate to you and how well is that actually being communicated? Um, so it's embracing those ideas. Yeah, I, I love this quote from uh, Ernst Gombrich that you quote in the book where he says, you know, there's 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 no uh, wrong reason for for liking a work of art, but there's plenty of wrong reasons for for not liking uh, a, a work of art. So, I mean, a, a lot of people when they're talking about art of any kind, they'll say, "Yeah, I liked it," and then someone says, oh, "I didn't like it," and then they move on <laughs> to the next the next part of the conversation. And, right. and it doesn't seem like a, a conversation that's likely to uh, result in much much growth. So, so should we, you know, should we be if 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 we if we like it, you know, shouldn't that inspire some curiosity as to why we like it? And then if we don't like it, shouldn't that inspire some curiosity to maybe try and figure out ways that we can start to like it? I mean, should we should exactly. we is the is the liking informative? Does it does it begin the the, the process of curiosity, or or do we need to kind of suspend exactly our where... our our? It's... No, and I think and and you're hitting on on an on on exactly the right point, which is that you have to trust yourself and your feelings and your responses. And if you don't, if you come in with an attitude that either you can't trust yourself or you shouldn't trust yourself, or you should only trust yourself, um, you know, without taking in anything outside of yourself, then, then you're up against a wall. So yes, you have to be um, at the highest level, fully subjectively engaged in the experience and at the highest level, fully objectively engaged in the experience so that it takes a level of rationality that you would use, say, if you're doing a math problem or trying to navigate uh, your car through a, through a, a street. Um, and at the same time, or, you know, or to understand the world so that you know not to run over a pedestrian, blah, 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 but, um, mm -hmm. or two and two equals four. But it also takes the highest level of subjective experience and Greenberg, another person I quote in that same passage or near that with the Gombrich, is that it, it, one of the things he says is that um, you need the highest level of subjectivity and objectivity because then you get to a place where you can almost become uh, a kind of every person, where mm -hmm. you get to a level of objectivity where you're seeing exactly the rational experience, you're having that rational experience. But you can't get there without bringing the subjectivity to begin with. And if yeah. you don't want to stand in front of the work of art, I mean, you give it some time. But at a certain point, if you don't like it, move on. You know, I mean, it's not, you know, <laughs> it's not a test if you're, you're not in trouble for not liking something. Um, but there's plenty of great work out there that can act as an entryway to all art. Uh, you know, all it takes is one great work of art. And once you pass through that doorway, just as you would with one poem, one song, one love affair, one great meal, uh, one great bottle of wine, whatever it is, um, then you're open to the entire world of 
be it music or art or poetry or love or food or mm -hmm. so so it's really just um you know don't beat yourself over the head for the fact that you don't like something but start with something that you do like um you know go to something like a rembrandt say if you like it or maybe the colors are too dark and you find it like musty and you know makes you feel uh <laughs> Like you need to take a bath. I don't know. You know, Rembrandt might not be your thing. Maybe it's something else. But but as long as you can enter into it, then you've entered into the entire language and dialogue of all art from all eras. And that's the um, that's the thing that I would stress. You know, don't don't work too hard. But eventually, yes, you're going to have to work really hard to um, mm -hmm. to get in to get deep in. I mean, yes, you can get in and, and, and you, know, you can enter a swimming pool from any place. You can dive in, you can walk in, you can go down the ladder, you can go down the stairs, whatever. You could be in the shallow end, the deep end. It doesn't matter. Once you're in the pool, you're in the pool. And once you get wet, then um, you're experiencing the experience. So great art gives you infinite ways to enter. And um, one was made just for you, specifically, um, if it's a great work. You'll, it'll find, it can give you an entry point um, that works just for you. Yeah, so and I think that's one of the great things. It's a very personal, but also universal kind of experience. Yeah. Yeah. So it seems like people who who simply say, I like, don't like, like, don't like, they're missing something important. But but so too are, are the people who are sort of, you know, affectless, and, you know, uh, completely intellectual with respect to their analysis of art. I mean, so, I mean, can can art be... A, a purely intellectual exercise. I mean, some people would say that that's the that that's a deficiency of contemporary art is that it's it's too too intellectualized. I mean, can 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 it be great art if it, if it doesn't have the capacity to to move one in in a in a powerful emotional way, spiritual way, and well, physical I think, way? I think, I think you even are, said that you at know, one point that great art is a full body experience. Yes. I, and I, I believe that. I believe that, that, you know, some paintings make your heart skip a beat or they, you know, they really, you know, or some sculptures, whatever. Some music does that, too, where you, you know, you feel it before you have any thoughts about it whatsoever. I, I mean, my my I certainly believe in analyzing works of art at the highest level. Um, but I don't and I don't see it as an exercise. I see it as a as another way through and into what it's telling me. To understand, you know, I think that um, that reflection um, is part of the experience. You know, what what is the larger not message? Because I don't believe art has messages, but but what questions does it ask? What um, where does it take me? Uh, the, your point about the the difference between contemporary and and older art, I think it's really about a sense of approach. I mean, I've had bad art history teachers who only talk about the symbols in works of art and never talk about um, the poetry or the um, the serenity or the, the sub sublime light or um, all the mystery about art, which of course is one of the aspects. Um, and a mystery, you, you can never unfold that, you can never really get at the mystery, but that's part of the power of it is that you keep going deeper into that. Um, some work, uh, some contemporary work especially is maybe doesn't have mystery or, you know, maybe it's there just to niggle you or to trip you up or to get you to question something. It might be working on only one cylinder. Um, it's not a question of whether or not it's art per se, but how deep a level of art is it? Um, so art can, art can have many different functions, you know, Duchamp's fountain, his the urinal that he signed and put up, you know, put on its side on its back on a pedestal in 1917 that I mentioned in the book, you know, that had a specific purpose beyond, uh, you know, that, that was kind of held to the idea that he really wanted to upset the apple cart. And he certainly did with that work. Did he mean it to be a great work of sculpture in the way that a Bernini is a great work of sculpture? No, not at all. And he didn't have the abilities as an artist even to do that. So he did something else. So it's really about getting at what is the artist's intent. And once you get to the at least uh, the full level of what the artist's intent is, 
if you unravel that and there's no more, you know, if you spent the time there objectively and subjectively with it and you get to a point where um, there's nothing else to see here, <laughs> might as well move on, then yes, that can happen. I think the problem is often we close down too quickly in front of works of art and and only get to, you know, get through two doorways when there's an infinite number of doorways through which you could go. Now, now you talked about this experience you had when you were young, uh, when you encountered a, a, a work by uh, Paul Clay. And you said this was sort of the first work of art that you really, that really, um, really impacted you. Um, so, you know, what was it, what was it that, that, made you why did this particular work open doors for you and and set you on this path i think um i mean i could go into my own personal history to some degree but um not long before i saw that painting i'd gone through a very serious breakup that had really thrown me emotionally and sent me into a deep depression and i think that um you know, there are other things going on in my own life, relatively speaking, in terms of what I was interested in, what I was attracted to. Um, I didn't really, you know, I didn't really respond to Rembrandt or Leonardo or all of these artists I was studying in, in my art history classes. Uh, the art historians were making them dry and dull and symbolic and, you know, identify all the saints. And it was a lot of memorization and a lot of um, mm -hmm. kind of uh, rote, dry, fall asleep in your chair um, in the dark room kind of art history. And, and I didn't really know that art could be like Paul Clay. I'd always, I'd, I worked with children ever since I was very young. I grew up in a daycare center. My mother had one. I was always interested in children's art and I collected it. And um, I knew about Paul Clay, but I didn't know about the range of clay, and I'd never seen a, a clay in the flesh. So I was attracted to him. But when I saw the painting in the flesh, and I experienced the light in it, um, which I said in the book, I described it to a friend of mine as like an eye massage, I spent the entire afternoon with that one painting. And no work of art had held me that way. And I think I was drawn to my love of animals in it. It's about a dog. Um, you know, it's about so many things, but it's basically a dog howling at the moon. But um, and it's an abstract painting. But I because I because I was so in, uh, you know, enticed by or seduced by the color in it, which was so weird to me because it was icy and soothing at the same time, um, because I spent time and I thought it was funny and, and humorous. And I didn't know it was like a child's painting. I didn't know art could be so great, but also refer to childhood which was one of the things that he did. He often worked with childlike painting. That was another metaphor that he did. He also worked in manuscripts and all kinds of, um, made things that looked like Egyptian art. He, you know, nothing was beyond his grasp or reach. And um, so I think in standing with that painting and spending that amount of time with it, which was probably two or three hours, I was able to finally understand for the first time um, how line can be uh, muscular, and have an arabesque and move through space and move in and out of the plane of the painting. And I, for the first time, I really had an understanding or a deeper understanding of what space was in a painting, how it could be held flat and it could be malleable or elastic and that a painting could be fun um, and also have great light in it. And it could be about a subject that, you know, like dogs, <laughs> I loved animals. So like that it could be all of these things simultaneously and pull on all of these different ideas. And so for me, it was an entryway into um, a kind of, uh, um, you know, in terms of the idea of the depression that I had, it was something that opened up to me this deep level of experience through art that I think, you know, if you've had a deep level of experience, whether it's love or depression or loneliness or all these things that we all feel, um, when art touches at that level of a deep experience, psychologically, emotionally, and you understand it physically in terms of its formal properties and how it's getting you there. I think, and I don't know if you're following me, but that there's a merging that takes place um, where you're taken into another realm. You go through this passageway that is, um, you know, that's open to everybody and that is the realm of art, you know, this realm of play, of metaphoric analogy and of, of thinking, about, you know, of of interacting with the thing, relating to it. Um, 
that was my that was my entryway and you know that opened me up to everything else i no longer cared what my art historian said i just went and looked at paintings you know and sculptures yeah. then uh, because <laughs> i had my own way in i didn't need them any longer to i mean I, of course i had to go to class but but i realized that they were they were making art dead for me whereas the work itself was making it alive well, I mean, that, that sort of implies that you, you, I mean, it's almost like a, you know, Protestant view of art, right? You don't need the, the, the priests to, to explain how, how to experience it. But I mean, th there is a role, right, for the, for the priests and, the, and, and the critics. Otherwise, you know, you, you wouldn't have a job. But, but, but um, you know, when I was just well, bemoaning with a colleague who is art historian, the, the way in which we teach art history you know, which, as you mentioned, is just we're just rattling off dates and facts and figures. I mean, why do we still do that? I mean, isn't there there's got to be I mean, if the goal is to teach people, well, how I to never look, did. that certainly doesn't help. Well, yeah, that was not the way I taught art history and I taught it for 20 years. I mean, I mostly, you know, I would show a contemporary work or a modern work next to an ancient work and show how they were in dialogue with one another, because really that's what art is. It's art, art only cares about art. Art's in dialogue with art. It doesn't care when it was made or, um, or who made it, or, you know, cares nothing about that. It only cares about itself. Um, and so for me, it's about, you know, the rhythms, the music, the emotional qualities, the light, the metaphor, and I'm very interested in how a work of art opens metaphorically. I think for me, the most important experience, and this is not something that most people will do, but it's certainly something that is an age old practice and that I learned as, as a student is to draw from art, you know, literally draw from it with a pencil and paper mm -hmm. and try to go through the same moves that the artist did and try to understand it. And then when you start trying to piece all of this complexity together, like if you're analyzing a piece of music, if you want to compose music or if you want to compose as a as a as an artist, you start to get at what those what that artist was doing. And I and I think for me, that was you know that I have my students do that because it it humbles you um, to no end. And it also makes you realize that when there are you know, it's not just a lady and a man on a bed or whatever, riding a horse. There are all kinds of of. Um, of inconsistencies and impossibilities going on about where the legs are and whose leg is whose and, and where the figures are in relationship to one another and how they're united or tied together or whatever. So that you get, you start to get at these metaphoric ideas that have nothing to do with the way the world looks. It's about the, the world of the artwork, not the world of um, the outside world because art is completely separate from that. You know, it's a completely separate thing. I do think you need critics to a degree if they're good. <laughs> now, you know, that's, um, you know, if they're going to try to help open the work up to you, you know, that's, um, and I think there are great art historians too. I'm not knocking art history as a profession or, or art historians. I uh, have learned, you know, very, very, very much from great art historians. That's, that's not the point. I do think though that having the, having a, um, you know, having some kind of something beyond theory about it is important. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of the art historians I had didn't really, had no, no actual experience, no empirical knowledge of what it meant to compose a work. Um, it doesn't mean they didn't have understanding, but their understanding was different from what an artist understands. So yes, in the end, um, you go to the work. The artwork is what's going to teach you. Uh, I often lament how bad art is today, but as long as there's a Titian to be seen in the Ferrari Chapel uh, of the Assumption of the Virgin, and artists have access to that, they can learn from Titian how to be an artist. They don't need anyone else. You know, as long as there are Paul Clay's on the wall, they can learn how to be an artist, uh, or Bernini fountains, or whatever else there is. Or you know, as long as the pyramids are there. I mean, it's you don't need all the uh, middle people. <laughs> You know, the art, the art is the teacher. Well, so, so you talk about kind of developing aesthetic judgment as really, you know, why you, I mean, you, you need this in order to get the most out of art, but the way in which you do it is by exposing yourself to art. I mean, can, can we view the, 
the critics or the art historians in some ways as as coaches, right? I mean, if if it's if it's really a skill that, that we're developing, right, a, a way of seeing, then you know we need we need coaches for to develop our athletic prowess, right? So so you know coaches could presumably help us with our um, with our aesthetic judgment, right? I mean, is is I don't think of when I think of uh, people teaching art history. <laughs> I don't, I don't think they think of themselves as, as as coaches. But but I mean, d- coaches can help, right? Um, yeah, and I you know I don't know if I'd use the metaphor of coach, but it's you know it works as well as any other. Um, it's you know there's hmm, there's a. I think that it's useful, and this is what my best teachers did for me, it's useful to have them ask you the right questions um, to mm-hmm. suggest that you look at this as opposed to this. And um, one, of the, one of the things I stress in my book is to resist the urge to name things and resist the urge to um, identify objects in a work. Um, apple, woman, horse, plant, whatever, but to try to um, move through that and get at what the 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 forms themselves are, you know, what are they analogous to, for instance? Um, not, is it an apple or, okay, so it's an apple, but what else also might it be? And, uh, mm-hmm. you know, what, where do you, how do you open yourself up to that? And I think that the the coaching is important in that sense. I might mean, certainly coach my students when I say to them, "What's?" I might sort of put up a painting and say, um, "What's wrong with this picture?" Meaning, um, don't look for, um, don't just identify all the figures in it, but where is there something that seems off or unusual or out of place or odd? about it. And if you come at a work of art that way to begin, um, you might notice immediately that the back wall is in front of the woman's head, which can't happen. But if you look at this side of her head, maybe the back wall is all the way up here and she's embedded in it. Whereas over here, maybe it's completely open. And then and then the question would be, why is the artist, so if, if this is coaching, then yes, you know, why would the artist do that? Is it because the artist is deficient? Yeah. Is it because the artist is a bad painter and p- can't put the head in front of the wall as he knows it is? Or is there more poetic reason for that? So it, those are the kinds of coaching um, co- coaching questions or prodding that, that I would do and that I think that we all need to do when we come to works of art. You know, not just identify uh, Orpheus and Eurydice and then move on, but to see how are they relating to each other. And, you know, what, you know, to ask that question, what is weird about this, I think is a very good place to start in front of any work of art uh, as a baseline. Yeah, I think you, you, you made a claim, which I think is similar to what I learned from my art history professors, which is, right, to learn how to think like an artist when you're looking at a work of art. And I think part of what that means is to start from the assumption that, you know, every aspect of what you are experiencing was intentional, right? <laughs> you know, like if, 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 yes. if it's, if it's yes. a color, you know, why is it that color? If it's a shape, you know, why is it the shape? If it's located in this place, you know, why is it located in this place? And if yes. you start from that assumption that it's intentional, mm-hmm. then you, you have to kind of reverse engineer, you know, what, what it's doing to you or, you know, what it's intended to do to you. Yeah, I think that they, um, that's a very good point, but it, because it, it, we don't question intention elsewhere. We don't look at an automobile and say, um, why is that bumper there? That was a mistake. Oh, it just happened to be left over. Or, and we don't look at poetry in that way either. We, we make a decision that every syllable, every letter, every p- piece of punctuation is there for a very specific reason. And I think that um, that art gets short shrifted that way. It's not it's treated as if like, oh, the artist didn't intend that to happen. And certainly the unconscious plays a part here. And I think that um, that uh, 
you know, I often use the analogy with my students that because they all say, oh, well, he didn't he can't have intended everything that he did. Well, if you leave it in, if the painter, if the artist leaves it there in the end, then, yes, he's signing off on it, no matter how it got there, whether he threw a confetti up in the air and then it landed on the on the page um, or whether whether there was painstaking, finicky kind of detailed finesse going on throughout the entire process. But um, one of the things that I point out to my students is, you know, when you watch a great basketball player go to the net from, you know, all the way across court and do a layup, you know, yes, it was intentional to do the layup, but every move that was done in, in maneuvering through the players and in the, in the, in the spinning and everything else. And, you know, that's, um, that's intuitive through a lifetime of, for that player of having practiced that particular sport. So there's muscle memory and intuition and subconscious stuff going on in art that is as important to the experience of the creation um, that a regular person who's never tried to do a drawing has no understanding about any way than an Olympic diver, you know, would, would understand about what an Olympic diver does. And, and these are the these are the things that I think are really important to keep hold of that that yes, there's unconscious stuff that happens and sometimes it, it responds or it opens up in you unconscious stuff. I mean, that's what Freud believed was the whole purpose of art was to so that we related on an unconscious level, on a subconscious level um, so that, you know, it would bring forth this stuff in the artist and then bring this stuff forth stuff, bring forth this stuff in you, the viewer. Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, you, you mentioned sports. I think you, you have a greater appreciation of a sport if you've actually played the sport, right? So when I, when I go to a basketball game, if I go with yeah. my cousin who's played basketball his whole life, you know, it's, it's, it's a very different experience for him. And, and I learn by, you know, going with, with him and and you 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 point out that maybe a, one way to enhance your aesthetic judgment is to attempt, you know, to do a little art yourself. But you know these things are are usually not well, taught together, right? We have we have art history departments, art practice departments. I remember when I was in college, I I did a minor where I combined the two because it, it seemed to me like you, you know you needed to to, to kind of give give it a try <laughs> uh, in order to to really kind of understand what you were seeing. Should we should we be kind of integrating the, the teaching of these things? I think that the, um, the only way really to teach art history well um, is to have artists, have the students draw from the works in the same way that the artists did. Uh, you know, uh, Leonardo drew from uh, Giotto and, uh, you know, Rubens drew from Leonardo and Matisse drew from Ru- Rubens and, and Renoir drew, you know, then Matisse drew from, you know, Rubens. Anyway, it's all just links in the chain. And yes, I think that that practice is the only way really to teach the, the, teach the practice and understand the practice. Um, and, and I do think, you know, part of, part of developing your aesthetic judgment is to, as you would with any, you know, we use our aesthetic judgment everywhere, whether it's we prefer this taste to that taste or this color to that color. Um, and these are the these are the things that you're doing with art too. You're using those, it's just human experience. That's all you're doing is bringing your human experience to it. It doesn't take any other skills than that, but it does take, it does require that you ask the right questions. You know, is this color, for instance, sour and acidic? Is it, uh, you know, is it cool? Is it warm? Um, is it hot? Is it, uh, uh, does, the, does this color recede or does it advance in relationship to the color next to it? Um, you know, you're, you're bringing your everyday knowledge um, because we're making judgments all the time about people, places, things, experiences, films, music, food, you know, these are all, we all, these are the only skills it takes to look at art. If your eyes are working, this is all it takes. You just have to ask them the right questions, uh, just as you would if you were a chef or if you were a musician or if, you know, um, you know, does it have melody or are the notes, 
Mm-hmm. Are there sour notes? You know, does it does it jar your ears? Does it jar your eyes? Um, and you have to think of it as music, I think, really, and how musical is it? And what kind of rhythm does it have? Uh, you know, Mondrian used to dance in front, well, he painted to boogie woogie music because he expected it to have that kind of rhythm and power. And if it didn't, it wasn't going to be a good painting. Um, these are things people, you know, can you dance to a painting? I think that's a good question to ask. What would this, mm-hmm. what would this painting, what would its rhythms be? Uh, you know, it's about getting more in touch, you know, and bringing all these things together instead of trying to see art as this separate thing that exists on a pedestal that we can't understand. It's got to be something that it's something we live with. You know, art has always been something we lived with mm-hmm. until recently when the museums happened. And now you had these things taken out of context and they weren't things that we lived with every day. Um, you know, they were suddenly art, you know. This is a new concept, this idea of art. It's a very modern idea, first of all. So it's really just about getting back in touch with our roots. This is a, you know, we're in infancy relative to this idea that art is something separate from our daily lives. It's, it's, it's a very recent, um, you know, uh, invention. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, everything you've been saying up till now really applies to all art, but the, the book is meant to focus on contemporary and modern art. And you do say that one aspect mm-hmm. of contemporary and modern art that sets it apart is that every modern artist has to have a kind of philosophy or, or stance, you know, a, about kind of, kind of art, or at least, you know, has to, is, is forced to think more consciously about a philosophy or a stance on, on art. Um, what is, what do you mean by that? I mean, is, do you think that, I mean, the, the earlier artists well, I don't did really not, <laughs> did, did they, did they not have no, to, I, I mean, the, they were I all think every art... thinking about their art in context, right? Yes. And I think all artists had a philosophy or a stance, even the ancient Egyptians who for 3000 years had the exact same philosophy and stance as a group um, in making abstract art that was for the gods um, that philosophy and stance was pretty damn important because if they didn't adhere to the rules and do them well and speak in the language of the gods, then society would fall apart. I mean, literally, the 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 planets would fall from the sky. You know, there'd be no afterlife. The world would end. So that's a pretty serious philosophy to have in relationship to something. And whether you're a a, a, a Roman Catholic painter or or a Reformation painter or um, an expressionist working out of kind of an existential idea, or you're an impressionist working from the ways in which light affects uh, you and nature affects you out in the landscape. All of these things are philosophies. I mean, every artist brings his or her philosophy, his um, reason for being to the, the work. Um, I think the difference that's happened in contemporary art is that um, since Duchamp, who wanted to make art more about that, that, you know, his, his idea, which I don't really buy, but his idea was to make art that stimulated your mind as opposed to your senses, your aesthetic experience, your um, visual appreciation. Um, there's a, there's a sense in, in, in that stance that, that art is of higher level if it stimulates the mind primarily, as opposed to is pleasing mm-hmm. to the, to the eye. And, and I think that at that point, there was a rift that happened. Um, and there have been many different uh, divisions that have happened since then. There are many artists working today who have very clear ideas about um, that their art is to disrupt or to challenge or to dethrone the art of the past. And I think that, you know, that's a modern idea uh, or a contemporary idea. I don't necessarily believe in it. There's a revisionist history going on right now that is suggesting that all artists in the modern era wanted to disrupt or shock or dethrone or, um, you know, up in the status quo. And I think the greatest artists didn't. They tr- continued the tradition out of which they were working um, by advancing it and making it contemporary in their time through their philosophical stance in relationship to the world. You know, philosophy changes 
but um, the one of the things I talk about in the book is the the movement, the cyclical movement between um, abstraction and figuration, and that uh, there's a theory that I think is very apt that that when when society is um, uh, feels comfortable in the world, they emulate it through figuration and representation. They create the space in their art that is like the space in, in the world in which they live. When they feel alienated or uncomfortable in the, um, in the world, then they create art that is abstract, that does, whose space is not um, uh, the same as ours or reflects our space in the world. And right now, I think we're in a very uncomfortable place since the Industrial Revolution, which is one of the reasons that we've moved back to abstraction. Now, certainly there's as much figuration going on as there is abstraction, but you have now virtual reality art and um, all kinds of things that are removing us more and more from our physical world. Uh, Art and virtual reality is another level of kind of abstraction from this particular society or this place where we are right now uh, because of the space in which it's, it's existing and happening. Uh, you know, it'll be interesting to see what happens in the next 50 years, too, in relationship to this. But uh, philosophies change, and with it, you know, people's modes of expression change. Um, so for, for something to, to be considered great art, in your view, I mean, do you have to, does there have to be an experiential element to it? I mean, some some people, one critique of some works of contemporary art is that, you know, you, you can, you know, you you can read about it, <laughs> you know, read, read the thesis and, uh, and experiencing it doesn't add anything to yeah, the, right. the validity of the thesis. Right. Well, there is, there is art out there that, um, you know, conceptual art that never needs to be created that can exist in your mind or, you know, I mean, your mind is a place too. Okay. So, um, it, even conceptual art takes a form, whether it's a, a thought is a form um, in that respect, whether it's, I mean, it's physical too, in the sense that it's energy or whatever, you know, don't, I don't, I don't, I don't want to talk out of my field of expertise, but, you know, electrical charges in the brain, that's, that's, that's something too. And so there really is no such thing as conceptual art, but there are artists who don't believe that, their work needs to be actually physically manifested, you know, that you don't have to make it. Um, that's a stance. Have I seen anything that, um, or have I seen anything? Have I experienced anything or, or heard about anything at that that's conceptual that I would put on the level of great? No, nothing. I, I think that there have been some interesting things done, but in this, we, this is where we get back to the aesthetic judgment which the very process of aesthetic judgment is one question, basically, greater than, less than, equal to. And when you've had a great experience with a great work of art, that elevates, that takes it all the way up here. Um, and that gives you a, a, uh, a bar that all other art has to, um, now each artist is different. So, you know, who's the better artist? Uh, Titian or uh, Mondrian. Well, that's not really the issue because they're both very different. They have both both have very different philosophies, relatively speaking. They both are doing different things. I think they're both equally great in different ways. But the the issue then is where does Duchamp's fountain come up in relationship to that? And for me, it's way way down here. It's an interesting idea. Um, and you know, as soon as Duchamp's fountain happened, basically that shifted the whole. Uh, argument into the idea that if an artist says it's art, it's art. It doesn't matter what it is. You know, when he bought a snow shovel out of a a hardware store and brought it home and hung it up and called it art, that changed the die. That changed it entirely. Um, Now that's, that's, if he says it's art, that's it. So it's not really, the question then becomes not, is it art, but is it good art? How good is it? How does it compare to other art? Um, Now, a lot of people don't believe in these hierarchical distinctions. 
um, at least not with art. They would believe it if they slept on a bad bed or heard bad music or had a bad meal that gave them um, food poisoning or <laughs> had a car that didn't run or, you know, they want their bridges to be structurally sound, but they don't care if their paintings are structurally sound. And these things, you know, you're, a, a painting, if you cross a painting, it's not going to kill you if it falls apart, but a bridge will. So the, the, the belief here is that some things need to adhere to this uh, hierarchy and some things don't. I, I think that everything should adhere to some kind of level of aesthetic judgment, experiential judgment, all of these things. Um, a, uh, a, a friend of mine who's a painter was going to a, uh, her dentist and her dentist collected outsider art, which is art made by people who are outside of the mainstream. They haven't had formal education. You know, it's, um, it's not folk art per se. It could be, but it's basically art that is considered great, despite the fact that these people made it without any formal or, or, um, under, you know, formal understanding or teaching. And she asked him once, or he asked her once, the painter, uh, the dentist asked her, what, what do you think of outsider art? And she, cause he said, you know, I collect it. It was in the, you know, in the waiting room. And she said, what do you think of outsider dentistry? And I think that that's a question <laughs> that needs to be asked about any kind of work here. Um, you know, what do you think of but, outsider I mean, the, the engineers? Caves of Lesko, engineers? The caves of Lesko. What do you think of we, but What? But you know, we we have we we put the caves of Lesko in in the canon, right? I mean, and that that's certainly yeah. outsider art. I doubt they had no, any formal they training, are, right? But well, they yeah. did because they 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 created the very art. They created the language that we're t that we're speaking now. And interestingly enough, Picasso went into the caves, uh, either in Altamira or Lesko. Mm -hmm. I don't know which it was. Um, but when he left, he said to his guide, we've, we've invented nothing new. I mean, he was both humbled and um, also reassured by the fact that the bulls he was painting in his own pictures were exactly doing the exact same things as the bulls that were being painted 40,000 years before. And that's the tradition I'm talking about in terms of the language. Um, they you know, they were, they taught themselves, so to speak, but it came out of an essential need to communicate whatever it was that they wanted to communicate, the life and energy and weight and ballast and movement and, and, um, you know, of the bulls, you know, that, which is the same things that Picasso was interested in. So, you know, that's the lineage, you know, that's the dialogue that art has, is that, Picasso had never seen these bulls before, but he was painting the exact same thing in his own studio. And he was also interested in painting bulls being from Spain. I mean, you know, he was interested in the bullfight, but, but he was doing, I mean, you look at some of Picasso's bulls, they're ex they just, they look like they're, they could have been done on the, on the Lasco caves and vice versa. Um, that's the revelation here. I think, um, you know, they're interested in the same language. It is the same language that we're speaking. Um, and it begins with metaphor, basically, um, not mem not mimetic ideas. Yeah. Well, you know, you describe in the book um, an experience you had with uh, work by Maria Abramovich, right? Where uh, you it was mm -hmm. purely experiential, right? And you know, there's no there's nothing you can own. There's there's no nothing you can hang on the wall, uh, but it is non nonetheless. Um, a work of art. Could could you describe that experience? And and you know, is that is that an experience that's that's different in some way from your experience with with clay? Um. <clears throat> well, yes, it's a different experience. But um, then to codify experience and what's useful, or I mean, if if you're judging experience. Um, or, you know, is the experience of a roller coaster, uh, is that charge, um, that's a charge just like looking at a Titian painting is a charge, just like having an orgasm is a charge. I mean, you know, there are different ways to, you know, the, the, all of these experiences, these human experiences, all, you know, they can't be separated out and they're, they're all intertwined. And I, 
And I think that, yes, I certainly got a charge out of looking at clay. I also got a charge, an unexpected charge, out of um, out of engaging with the Abramovic performance, which was um, just to for your your viewers, your readers, your listeners, whatever it. You put on uh, noise canceling headphones and a blindfold, and they didn't exactly work. But then you were put into a bright white room so that you couldn't see and you couldn't hear um, with other people. And then you would move around the room as long as you wanted, and you raised your hand when you wanted to leave. But you interacted with other people in the room. Um, when I was, I, I was very skeptical of it going in, and I think that um, uh, you know I didn't really believe in the idea of it because I think that the randomness, for one thing, is it's too random. It's more like a psychological experiment. Mm -hmm. But I had a um, an interesting or uh, I should say a charged experience from it with dancing with a woman in the room who may have been Abramovic herself. I don't know. Um, but she did have long hair like like she does. And she was a good dancer. She moved very well. So so she and I interacted with each other in the in the space. And I did have um I did have experiences that I couldn't have had in any other particular situation. And I think that in that sense, the artwork, if it provides you with a unique experience that opens you up to yourself and to larger experiences in the world and connects with other ideas, one of the things it did was remind me of an experience that had happened 30 years ago that I had kind of forgotten about, about being stranded on a subway platform in Brooklyn um, with where all the lights were off. And um, it, re, you know, reminded me of, of moving through that space and kind of being um, ill at ease. But it also got me in touch with senses that I hadn't had to use before, which was purely, purely physical because I couldn't hear and I couldn't see these things that we rely on. And I think in that respect, um, art's job is to open those senses up. Um, whatever, to, to, to open doorways in you um, that hadn't been opened before. Um, do, I, do I prefer that to a great Matisse painting? No. Um, do I think it has its place? Certainly. Uh, you know, again, it's about what do I prefer? Well, I'm happy to have had that experience. And, you know, I didn't break a, mm -hmm. an ankle or anything, or, you know, I didn't, I got through it safely. So, um, you know, I've certainly gotten whiplash from being on a roller coaster. Um, so, you know, it's it's a charged experience that has its place. Um, and we should be opened up to, open to all of these experiences, I think. Uh, it doesn't mean that you have to go have a, an Abramovic experience, you know, in a performance. No. Uh, or that you have to go look at Matisse either. But, uh, you know, art runs the whole... Uh, you know, it's it's a wide ranging set of ideas and possibilities. Um, well, you mentioned that looking at art is an extension of looking at the world. I mean, should should we view the should we view the success of a work of art as opening up new ways of looking at the world? Right, the non art world. Uh, I, I remember, you know, one of the things that I got out of painting and and looking at artists that when I look at non-art of course I can't look at it uh the same I have to look at it differently but you know could could art be valuable if it just helps you to understand more art right I mean does it have to does it have to have some external <laughs> reference or can it simply reference other art no I think that um I think art art exists for art's sake Art is only art, and um, I don't think it has any any job to uh, help with social justice or change the world or change, uh, you know, or, or help with climate change or to uh, assist with starving people or to it has no it has no other purpose other than to be art and to be in dialogue with other art. Now, certainly art doesn't exist without the people who make it and the experience of it. But it is there and it is meant to just uh, be in relationship to other art. Now, I'm sure I get a lot of, uh, of a lot of people would disagree with me, but I do think that's its main purpose. I think it has no function other than that. Now, I do think that it can certainly open you up 
to other kinds of experiences in the real world. Um, I think that, you know, I, I will go see a great painter um, and then for maybe a day or two afterwards, I might see my, my experience of the world, especially let's say it's a landscape painter. Then my experience of the landscape, the actual landscape is seen through that artist's eyes. My experience of the light is, you know, or my wife and I, my wife's a painter. She and I will talk about sometimes, oh, that's a Poussin sky, or that looks like a Turner sky, or, oh, the, this is like, this is like Corot's light right now, or Courbet. Mm -hmm. And so there are, there are moments when, when you, you realize because they're, because these artists are getting at a truth um, about our experience and of the, and a truth about the world that when you recognize those truths in the world, you're taken back to those artists. So mm -hmm. yes, it's, it, can art make you a better person? Not necessarily. And that's not its job. I do think it can certainly make you more um, open to experience, but that doesn't make you necessarily a better person. You know, you can still be a serial killer mm -hmm. and have the greatest appreciation for art that, uh, that anyone has ever had. You know, it's it's not going to ch necessarily change you, and that's not its purpose. Um, it exists fully to be itself, to exist in the realm of art. Um, well, you know, we were talking before we started about the number of museums that we have in the United States. We have an incredible amount of museums, and and you have some discussion in the book about you know how to get the most out of a museum experience or what museums should be thinking about in terms of providing the most value to the folks who are um, using the museum. And, you know, if the goal of, of art is to develop aesthetic judgment, right, if that's sort of how we encounter art, how, how can museums enhance that? And, and I think something you're suggesting is that museums are, are not really trying to do that <laughs> as much as they're trying to do some other things, right? So you mentioned, you know, making art more accessible uh and i think your point is that well you know the maybe there's some inherent inaccessibility or at least there's some some work that needs to be done in order for you to fully appreciate art yeah there's been a shift in museums in the last 30 years to make them quote more accessible and i think that that is a um i think it's a misstep in many ways I think it's a misunderstanding of art. Um, I think there also there's also a, a push to make them more diverse, um, to make exhibitions reflect their audience, to you know make works that are by the um, audience members out there, to to make work that is about their experience, as opposed to letting the work just speak to itself, uh, speak for itself. And um, I think there's also a push right now that art is supposed to be about social causes. It's supposed to serve social causes. And I think that that's also a huge mistake. The, the, the purpose of art is to, um, to be itself and it, it has no other job. So once you start making art about, um, once you start focusing on the biography of the artist or the subject matter of the artist or the intent of the artist, um, as being more important than the finished work, you've shifted the perspective off of the work itself, which is the whole purpose of the museum, is to have the work, and onto the makers, the subject matter, the um, you know the background behind it, the you know, all of these I ideas that are separate from and don't matter to the work of art, because the artwork doesn't care who made it or what the purpose was. Either it works or it doesn't. And the only way to know if it works is for us to experience it on an aesthetic level and on a personal, emotional, intellectual, all of these levels. Um, and, and great art also, I think the other issue here is that it's universal. <clears throat> it's not, when it, when it reaches a level of greatness, it speaks to everyone. It doesn't only speak to this particular group or this particular group, which is how, they're, how museums are now trying to posit art whether they want to make it about entertainment, whether they want to make it uh, Van Gogh immersions, or they want to make it um, accessible and that they want to remove the stairways from the museum so that you don't feel like it's an elitist experience. I do think it is an elitist experience. And I think that in the highest, as a highest compliment, that when you, once you get to a certain point with art, 
it is a high level of experience. And that's exactly what it's there for. But all art, as I was saying earlier, is accessible to everyone. You know, it's, it's, uh, you've got encyclopedic museums deciding that their work doesn't speak to everyone, which is just an impossibility. You know, if they really em- embraced what they had, they would know that there's something there for everyone because we're all human beings. And that's really what it is. It's art. And then we get into the level of, is, you know, is AI art and, you know, is all of these other ideas that are being floated right now um, in the courts as well as in the, in the art world. It, it, and, and so it gets more and more complex. And the, the notion of diversity becomes part of the issue, too, and of, um, uh, you know, all kinds of other issues come into play here, too. And museums are trying to, to I think, answer to the public in ways where they're not, where they're, they're not giving themselves the credit and their work, the, the artwork, the credit for doing that, the work that it can do. Um, that's, I mean, that's my position about where I think, you know, what the problem with museums are right now. And they, if they just let the work be and, and show great work and be stewards for great work and conservators for great work and um, offer it to the public, they don't need to be so involved, for instance, with some of the issues that they think are so pressing right now, um, because these issues are going to leave, you know, issues come and go and the art remains, you know. But, but it seems like, I mean, at least with respect to the great religious works, I mean, they were about something, you know, more than, than, than art itself, right? I mean, they, and their intent was to, to improve their their viewers. Yes, and and certainly, um, well, improve. I mean, I think some of it was meant to scare you. I mean, some of those, uh, um, you know, those those uh, depictions of hell in um, you know where the damned go are very frightening. Um, and they 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 put that next to you know this is where the chosen go. This is where the damned go. Do you want to be in you know eternal bliss or do you want to be um, in eternal fire? And so, yes, there's been art. Art does have a propagandistic uh, aspect to it, and has been used by people in power consistently. And all of those things are are um, important aspects of and functions of art through history. I mean, you know, art art is made by the by the by the people who won the wars. You know, by the people who are in power traditionally, not the pe- not the losers. So it certainly is propaganda. But then. The question becomes: um, Is it great? Is it great? For, does it does it um, does it transcend propaganda to become art, or is it just propaganda? And I think that too much of the work that's being being created today is is like socialist realism from Russia. Um, it's propagandistic. It's pushed toward illustrative. It's it it has one one level of of importance and not much more than that and what you don't have to be a you don't have to be a practicing christian to appreciate the glory of a cathedral and what that experience is um if you're if you're a practicing christian maybe it has a different kind of uh import for you but it's but you know you can go into shark cathedral and and have a transcendent experience on this planet in a way that that cathedral was meant to, to give, you know, the very experience that cathedral was meant to give you, um, that, you know, I, for me, do I, you know, there is proof in a sense of there being something more in that kind of experience or in a Titian painting, you know, or in a Matisse. Matisse once famously said that, uh, you know, his, his chapel that he did in Vaughn's, um, yes, it glorified God, but he said, I am God. <laughs> And he wasn't being, he wasn't saying it as, it wasn't uh, some kind of egotistical thing. He was saying that, you know, God is working, if there's a God, God is working through me. I am a high, I am working at the highest level of art. And if God exists, I'm the conduit for God. I am God. And this chapel is proof of that. Um, It doesn't mean necessarily that, yes, he's saying this is a proof of Jesus Christ, and this, which was what the purpose of this chapel was to to, but he was saying the artist, you know, this is, you know, I'm the, it's flowing through me, you know, and here's the creation. Uh, 
So, so do you think that, that the typical museum goer is squandering the, the value of the museum by trying to look at too many paintings too quickly? I mean, it seems very much like our, you know, art history classes on, on steroids, right? Um, where very little effort goes into the appreciation of any of the individual works. Yeah, it's, um, I mean, I, I wouldn't, I don't think that the viewers are really the problem, relatively speaking. Um, I do think, yes, if you're going in and taking, you know, taking a photograph of the wall label and the, and the, the work and then doing a selfie and moving on, then you're doing yourself and the work a disservice. Um, I, my, my feeling is that, you know, you really have to listen to yourself and to, to what your needs are and what your tastes are and not go to, you know, not only go to artists whose names you recognize, like a Van Gogh. Yeah, the Van Gogh in the room might be the best work on the wall, but it might be one whose colors have changed because the pigments changed and it, it might be a mediocre Van Gogh, um, relatively speaking. And so there might be something by another artist you've never heard of in that room that is not only a better work, but may speak to you um, in ways that you never imagined. And so that's what I, I you know, as long as viewers are, are open and, and let their egos go and let it not be about what they think they know or um, what they, they imagine they should know. And actually trust their intuition, their their hearts, their guts, their minds, and you know go to the things that they're that that speak to them. Um, you know, listen a little bit, and then if it doesn't speak enough, move to something else. It's really it 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 all comes down to a level of honesty, basically. Uh, that's the you have to bring it to the work. You can lie to everyone, but don't lie to yourself. You know in front of art, you know, I mean, it, you know, that's, you're, 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 you are doing yourself a disservice if you lie there. Yes. Well, and, and you, you mentioned that when you're standing in front of the pyramid, the great pyramid, you, you, you were, you experienced it as a work of art. Um, do, do, should we be looking at everything as a potential work of art? Um, I mean, museums kind of, define art and say if it's in the museum it's art you know if it's not in the museum it's 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 not art right every i mean to is there a limit to our openness to to seeing you know every human creation as as a work of art i think that the um you know, I mentioned Duchamp earlier that if an artist says it's art, it's art. But there was a movement in, you know, mid-century in America about trying to break down the um, the boundary between art and life. And, uh, you know, some people made whole careers out of that and still are, um, that, you know, everything is art. Uh, it's, it, I, I don't buy into that. Um, I I mean, or or sure, it's fine if an artist wants to say that his whole life is a work of art. Fine, fine. But I don't have to engage with it. You know, not everything we do is is worthy of other people's attention. And, um, you know, I think that an artist's responsibility is to to edit him or herself and the work and to put out only what is what really matters and what can communicate whatever it is that the artist wants to say. Um, is it? You know, there's a. I think that there's a. There's a. I think that viewers should be questioning museums when they go there. Um, there are a lot of reasons why artworks end up or or exhibitions in museums that have nothing to do with the quality of the work. Um, it could be that a board member has a, a collection of this crap and wants to increase the cost, the the value of it. So demands that if he's going to give a wing to the museum, that they do a retrospective of this crap you know, and this crappy artist. So that might be the reason that in some town that you get a show of crap. And I think that uh, there are many other kinds of reasons, whether they're political or financial or, or whatever else, you know, that are completely capricious, that have nothing to do with the quality of work. But that also has to do with the time in which we live, where works end up in museums for many different kinds of reasons. And it's um, often... You know, I think some of the some of the best painters out there at times are not being shown 
because they don't fit the criteria of what's important or they haven't gone through the gallery system and ended up at the blue chip galleries that then have control, for instance, on some levels over what ends up in the museums. Um, or, you know, sometimes collectors have more power than museum directors because they have the money. And so they can strong arm or almost extort the museums into showing work that um, otherwise may not end up in a museum. So viewers need to come at it, come to museums and say, just because it's here, just because it's headlining, doesn't mean that it's worth my time. And yet that's when you bring in that, that personal subjective experience. And you don't have to know about it just because it's being shown. You know, uh, there are plenty of exhibitions that I pass over because I've seen a work by the artist. And sometimes I shouldn't do that because sometimes an exhibition will shift my perspective on an artist whose work I've only seen very little of. You know, that, and that's the power of art, too, is that, you know, that's one of the great things about being a critic is that I've been forced to see work and engage with it that I never would have given time to otherwise, you know, because it was my job. And I've come around to artists. You know, this is the, that's the wonderful thing about art. You can hate it and then realize, hey, there's something here that I, that I was overlooking, that I, I didn't know. That, you know, I would never would have done the Abramovic uh, experience if I hadn't had to, uh, if I had to agree to speak about the work on a panel. Um, so I was, in a sense, forced to do it, kind of against my will. All right. But uh, mm -hmm. I'm glad I did. So, so not only can critics guide us by taking us to, to understand works that we may not have understood, but maybe they can inspire us by example to be more open-minded and curious uh, about art. Lance, thank you so much for joining me. The book is called uh, The Art of Looking uh, and also uh, plenty of other writing in various channels, including Wall Street Journal. Appreciate you joining me. Talk again soon. Thank you, Gregory. It was a pleasure to be here. This is Unsilo brought to you by Alumni FM, connecting people through stories.